Okay, welcome everybody. It's good to see such a huge screen on Zoom today. Um, I'm Mary Schlechta, and uh, along with editors Thomas Fukalora, Jane Ormerod, David Lawton, uh, Lindsay Ellis, who's our newest fi uh, fiction editor, and George of Wallace, we um, welcome you to this celebration of our ninth anthology. If you haven't seen it, if you're on Facebook and you haven't seen it, this is it. It is absolutely beautiful. So you can applaud for the, for the book. Okay. It's called Escape Wheel. And I thought I'd explain that a little bit if you, if you were wondering what it was and you hadn't read the introduction. Um, there's a little mechanism in non-digital watches and clocks that um, does it, it kind of moves forward, it's moved, but it can't keep going. It sort of, it moves forward, it makes a tick, and then it comes back, a tick and a tock. So we thought that was like a perfect title for our anthology because here we are, sort of time is moving and, well, here we are, right? Um, we think it, we thought it was a pretty apt metaphor for, um, for what's happening. The cover is by um, an artist, a photographer named Michael Shane. And um, if you haven't seen it, it's gorgeous. It's a picture of a laundromat from inside of a laundromat with the washing machines are completely still. But out of the window, you see this um, very silent but beautiful New York City in the distance. And so, um, as we say in the introduction, we hope we're looking for the time when the machines will turn again, the seats will be filled and the city, all of our cities and all of our homes will come back to life again. You can find the anthology and all of our solo collections online. Um, please look for a discount code if you're ordering one. And now if you could just please put your hands together and welcome all of our readers today. We have six poets and two fiction writers. Thank you. All right, our first writer is all the way in Sad, well, a small town called Sadness in Norway, and he brings um, a whole audience full of, um, full of people who are listening there. So I'm saying hello to all of you who are there in Alan's corner. Um, Alan jo C. Jones is an award-winning poet and writer with an MFA in poetry from the University of New Mexico and a PhD in fiction from University of Louisiana Lafayette. He has taught in Mexico, Korea, China, Spain, and Louisiana, and he's presently an associate professor of literature at the University of Stavanger in Norway. His work has appeared in Ponder Review, Timber, Fiction Southeast, and others, and a novel is forthcoming in 2021 from Midnight Sun. So please welcome Alan. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, I just, someone just texted on the, I'm using a phone, so I have a very small interface, but someone just texted that they, they went to a school in Santa Fe and are from New Orleans, maybe? My mom's from New Orleans, and uh, that's pretty cool. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to just quickly show you my audience, because they don't have telephones, I don't think, that are connected, but they're going to hear me read. They've been very kind, because it's nighttime, it's late at night here in, in Norway, and so here they are. Uh, from, we have from, just so you know, we have Argentina, Serbia, uh, Norway, Norway, Norway. Okay, so here they are. Argentina, Serbia, Norway, <laughs> Norway, Norway. Okay. So anyway, so that, which is nice. And one of them, the other day is going to hold a, a light so I can see we're, we're at a little restaurant here in Norway and our, and our rules are different with COVID. So we don't have masks and stuff, but that's okay here because we're pretty low. Um, okay, so I'm gonna read three poems and try to make eight minutes, I think is my time. So there's three poems. The first is supposed to be funny. Second is supposed to be heartfelt. Third is supposed to be funny. Anyway, we'll see what happens. And the third one is from the, uh, it's from the anthology. So that's the grand finale. Okay, the first one is called Poetry and Power, a definition. And it's, everything here is from uh, Wikipedia, so it's just a found poem. The earliest, the earliest unambiguous poems to be found were propositions. For example, you are pretty as a perennial, let us intercourse. While ordinary objects like sticks and stones can function as poetry, by the 13th century, words could also break your bones. Something repurposed, converted, or enhanced to become a poem is termed poemized such as a poemized virus or a poemized laser. In a broader context, poems may be construed to include anything used to gain strategic advantage over the heart. For example, limited precision when speaking of Cupid's ballistics. Poetry is a resource, like minerals, machinery, and humans. Rich communities will often extract it from poorer ones. Sometimes, all of poetry pertains to no more than eight 
wooden spears. It can also refer to less overtly malicious patterns of subjugation. For example, the ABAB scheme is the standard for love and also war. That's the first poem. Second poem. Thank you. Yeah, nice. Thanks, guys. Uh, I like. I can't hear anybody, but it's. Uh, you guys. You guys are supposed to clap. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just just gonna force my audience to clap. I, you know, I'm a real ham. Okay, number two. This one's the heart but one, so we can we can hmm for this one. This is called Heart's Desire. It's about my uncle. Um, yeah, Heart's Desire, which is a, a place in California. If you've been there, it's beautiful. We hike Heart's Desire up through oak and toyone, over a riprap of oyster shell and pine cone, the hillside inset with driftwood steps, down across the estuary to the pelted bark teepees of the Miwok village. An elder shows us the grip it takes to chip the sleek edge of a sibian, obsidian into an arrowhead. She tells us of the other time, racing sweat house to creek, a skinny coyote cracking jokes. Where are the people, we ask? Right here, she says. A flock of sandpipers circles the beach. The sandbar, Uncle says, they will land there. He teaches me to read first animals, then man. Age is a lot like wisdom, he says, no less, remember more. For Plato, thought was a caged bird. But it's my stupid heart flying back to the mountain. The prayer bell quickens, softening to a sacred mumble. Its message, keep listening. A word sometimes is also a door. Plato and my uncle are dead. The new thinking will soon answer everything. But when I returned, my uncle said, decades ringing that bell, still I hear only silence. Two birds in the cosmic tree, one eating, one watching, one nothing at all. A lifetime I have crossed heart's desire, a feathered thing circling. Clap. <laughs> No, or whatever. Okay, anyway, number three, this is the one from the, from the anthology, and I'm very thankful to the editors. Thank you so much for including this. Uh, it's wonderful to be included in this anthology. It's a beautiful anthology. I have the real thing here in Norway. You guys actually got it to me, which was amazing, because very little gets to me in this cold Arctic place. Um, <laughs> and it got to me. I have it on my desk. It's amazing. Um, so thank you. And here it is, and it's supposed to be funny, so uh, don't take it too seriously. Anyway, here we go. Imperial Note, 1815. It's unclear who lost the pinky. It is said that during Napoleon's exile on Elba, when the local theater group staged the then wildly popular Le Chien de Montaigne, a melodrama by Pixier Corp, featuring a trained canine, when the heroic Chien, the dog of the title, signaled the true assassin by ferociously attacking him, thus saving the falsely accused mute Eloi, and was in turn run through by the villain's sidekick, it is said that Napoleon laughed. In fact, while Napoleon had specified that a real dog must be violently gutted if you were to attend, <clears throat> the man had ruled the known world, for goodness sakes, he had his own box at the opera, there is evidence that he was seen to weep. Supporting this claim is the well-known fact that the exiled emperor had a dog of his own, was quite fond of it, and after the show, for reasons unknown, set the beast upon the actor who had played the villain. The other actors only able to beat it to death after it had torn up three pairs of trousers and swallowed a pinky. There was still some argument over whether or not this was early on during his exile when Napoleon could be seen most evenings weeping over his watered down wine on the back veranda, back, or in the last heroic days when he went bouncing around town quite drunk, wearing a violet in his hair and yelling, see, see, I told you so. <laughs> That's me. I hope you guys enjoyed it. One last time, audience, clapping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we certainly did enjoy that, Alan. And I love, I love that line, a word is often a door. That's yeah, nice. thank Very you. Nice. Yeah, thanks thank to your you. audience, too. Including me, um, yeah. She says thank you to all the audience. <laughs> yeah. Well, you. our next, um, our next reader is um, Kathleen Postma, um, who's going to read um, uh, a very Halloween, Halloween-y sort of story, I think. I, I thought it was nice and creepy. And enjoyed it very much. Many, many times I read it. Uh, Kathleen Postma has published fiction, poetry, nonfiction, and visual art in numer numerous publications, including the Los Angeles Review, Hawaii Review, Z Ziziva, and Natural Bridge. Her creative nonfiction piece, Becoming Foreign, was cited in Best American Travel Writing 
She is currently at work on a collection of fairy tales for adults entitled The Keys to Her Own Kingdom, as well as an autobiographical novel about an unremarkable woman who gets cancer, keeps a journal, and discovers in the writing that her life is an epic tale of discovery, triumph, and joy. Kathleen teaches creative writing and literature at Pacific University, Oregon. She lives with three remarkable daughters, one splendid husband, and one spoiled little dog. So join me and welcoming Kathleen. Yay! <laughs> Little dog That's, there. It's adorable. <laughs> Got this little dog flash there. Um, thank you. That's a lovely introduction. I'm so excited to um, be here. The book is really, really beautiful. It was like sweet yeah. happy when I opened it up. It's really beautiful. So thank you for all your work yeah. um, on this. Um, I want to just give a quick shout out to two of my students who are here, Bryn and Aaliyah. Hi, guys. I um, yeah. wanted to, to see the, your reading, see the reading and, and, and see what this is all about. And I make them read aloud in class all the time, so I think this is like a little bit of justice here. Um, I'm going to read from the piece that you so lovingly published in this magazine. It is a fairy tale. I'm not going to be able to read the whole thing. I'm going to keep to eight minutes. So I'm just going to read the first part of the story. I guess, I guess it has a happy ending in a brutal way, the way fairy tales do, so you know that's coming. Mm -hmm. But a little glimpse into um, one of the pieces that's in this collection that I've been working on. Okay, it's, uh, it's called Marla Puts on a Dress. Her name was Marla. She was 46, a dangerous, reckless age. She would say things like, if I knew then what I know now, or I don't drink as much as I used to, as if those words delivered in a deadpan voice meant she was safe to be around. She was not. She was passing for normal. Places where Marla passed, pushing her cart at the grocery store, jogging down the road in her white tennis shoes, backing her car or pushing her cart, excuse me, backing the car out to drive to work. If anyone bothered to look at her, Marla was a reassuring part of the suburban scenery, like a traffic light or an unremarkable hedge. <laughs> the bathroom mirror, she saw her rounded arms and bush-like hair and thought, hedge. Marla went on like that for years, keeping to the edge of things the way hedges do. Then one day, Rodney gave Marla a dress. In fact, he gave her three. She was jogging past his house in her white tennis shoes when he called to her. She groaned inside, literally groaned, because Rodney was a beast, a moody, butch, bitchy, whiny beast who lived next door. He said, good morning, gorgeous, got a minute? She said, yes, but ran in place indicating no. She huffed, she puffed, her thighs were muscled. Marla told herself she could kick the shit out of him if she had to, but that wouldn't be nice. The eyes in Rodney's massive tiger face ran wet with his fucked up story as always. She was the hedge he wanted to groom. He would feel so much better if she just let him. In the splendor of his jam-packed double car garage, he sat, big legs splayed in his Carhartt overalls, waving his paw toward a sagging rack of splashy clothes that hung on a wooden dowel attached by wires to the ceiling. Her, his mother had died a week ago and he brought all her stuff back to his place to sort through. An open door behind him revealed a kitchen table heaped with food neighbor women had made for him when word got out about his loss. Marla had left a chocolate sheet cake on his doorstep last night because he sh was, she was sure he was in bed. Several women would bake him meatloaf and lasagna because he was the biggest man on the street and single. Marla knew Rodney could comfort eat a whole cake in 10 minutes, even though he'd never admit it. She looked for signs of, ca of cake on his face. Was that a smear of chocolate on his chin? It looked like blood. Mm -hmm. There's three dresses, he growled. Oh, Rodney, she said, I don't wear dresses. Oh, you should. Women look good when they show off their legs. My mother did, his eyes filled with tears. This was nothing new. He was such a baby, but she guessed it was sad his mom had died, although it was odd he'd never mentioned her before last week. If Marla yanked any old thing off those hangers, then she could get out of there before he expected too much of her. Marla's ridiculous heart said, scurry toward him, but her mind said, run away now. This was her life in a nutshell. Two Marlas, each undermining the other all the time. No wonder she was a hedge, stuck going nowhere, passing for a woman. She went to the row of clothes that swung like headless flat and dancers over Rodney's pristine garage floor. He was a tidy beast, she gave him that. The dresses smelled of blood. She stepped back, put her hand to her nose. Don't you cry too, Rodney said. 
He wiped his own nose and the back of his hairy arm and then wiped the wet onto his overalls. Was that a ruffle peeking out from the open zipper on his chest? Was that lipstick on his lips? Alice slid her fingers between the dresses, so many they were packed together to fit on the rack. They seemed to be suffocating each other. She could not get a hold of one. Mama was 68 years old, Rodney said. Myla closed her eyes, fumbled for fabric that didn't make her skin crawl, held her breath against the stench. She left me when I was a baby, he wailed, said I was a monster. Then she flat out disappeared until last month when I finally found her at a retirement home five miles from here. Five fucking miles. She'd been there for years. Then she up and dies on me the minute I get close to her. Can you believe it? Maybe she spied on you all the time, Marla said. Maybe she walked by the house and you didn't even realize what Marla didn't say. Maybe she didn't want you. You need a haircut, honey. Rodney hoisted himself up and touched Marla's ponytail, always touching her. She yanked out a hanger full of cloth and thrust it between them. The dress hurt her eyes. It was the color of bubblegum sherbet, or worse, thrown up bubblegum sherbet, but not cheap, inexpensive and self-indulgent size 18, too big for Marla, or she, or she assumed, until she, until she draped it over her fleshy breasts and tummy. She ate jelly bellies one by one in her bed at night, as if by rationing them that way they would not make her fatter. The dress would just fit. Cinch at the waist, the silky fabric would drape to her thighs. It was so soft she could sleep in it. Rodney slid it off the hanger. Put it on, honey. I'll look the other way while you do it. The dress gaped between his paws. It looked like a bag he would trap her in. Marla stalled. You said three dresses. All right, then. He closed and then opened his yellow eyes like a big malevolent cat, calm and watchful one minute, ready to swallow her the next. This time, Marla searched with more intention. A black sparkly mini caught on her nails. Like a kitten at a shelter, it seemed to say, pick me, pick me. She fought to disentangle it from the others. Size five. Was this your mother's too? Maybe the mini got there by mistake. Rodney stroked the rough netting. Oh yes, he purred. I remember that one. From when you were a baby? That was blood on his chin. Marla was absolutely sure. What? Oh yes, mama's costume for the pageant, Miss Junior Texas, 1969. A musky bright scent, a pricey perfume came off the dress. It shimmered except for where the sequins had fallen off. There was a ragged swath across the back as if the wear had been brought down by a single strike of a paw like Rodney's. Marla thrust the dress at him. That would never fit me, but I'll take it. Next one you have to try on, he said. That would cheer me up. Put it on right here in the garage with everyone on the street to see, oh, I don't think so. He flicked a remote and the garage door began to purr downward closing out the safety of the other houses, the bland landscaping, and the natural light. It rumbled into place. Now we have some privacy, Rodney said. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad you ended it there so everybody now has to read that story. And find yes! Out who's the beast? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our next uh, reader is uh, Zev Torres. Uh, Zev Torres is a writer and spoken word performer whose work has appeared in publications including Post Stranger, Mad Gleam Press, Suitcase of Chrysanthemums, and I Let Go of the Stars uh, in My Hand, excuse me, by Great Weather for Media, yes. <laughs> um, Verses of Silence, and Pomona Valley Review. Um, since 2008, Zev has hosted Make Music New York's annual spoken word extravaganza. In 2010, he founded the Skewered Syntax Poetry Crawls event series. So welcome, Zeb. On you. There we go. Sorry about that. I was playing around with my stand because I like to uh, stand when I do this. And one more second. Uh, take your time. Make yourself comfortable. <laughs> <sighs> Can I be sane? I'm going to step back. I think so. This may work. Thank you for the... Uh, Audio visual help over in the corner there. <laughs> from, my, from my audience who doesn't want to be identified. <laughs> New York isn't New York without you, love. So far in a few blocks to be so low. If I last strode you on West End Avenue, you, you're the only motherfucker in the city who'd forgive me. Pre dawn's calm is primed to shatter. By an anguished cry, there's nothing we can do. 
winds howl, nascent light scatters, absorbed by midnight's residue. Saul's path no longer apparent, weaving and wobbling, possibly falling. Sky gazers panicked by the erratic variant, espoused theories, baseless and maudlin. No one appears for the martyr's parade. Truth is but a parable. The promise of the future is like a charade, a barker's lure at a carnival. Inevi inevitably, as always, to skirt oblivion, we seek comfort in pools of sacred delirium. This may take you by surprise to rally a train of thought, savage your concentration, blur your focus, knock you off course. Someday has arrived. Do not worry. In a moment, you'll regain your balance and composure, find your wits have been restored, and well, once settled by the impression that everything appears more or less like it did yesterday, and the few details that feel different, the subtle shift in your rotation, a barely perceptible adjustment to the span between seconds, have not changed beyond the expected or ordinary or explicable, or have not changed at all, you will continue on your way, not even slightly aware that nothing ever will be the same. So the kids, they dance and shake their bones, politicians throwing stones, it's all too clear we're on our own, saying ashes, ashes all fall down. Because you listen to a maudlin tune to soothe your unrequited affections, struggle with self-control, could not resist the urge to check continually your ex's status and the status of your ex's friends and their friends veered between renouncing your faith and desperate, fruitless deal-making with both traditional and cloud-based deities, drafted hundreds of emails and texts, brimming with apologies and explanations, some of which you sent, which led to more apologies and more explanations, bursting with pleas and recriminations, some of which you sent. Slog through a mire of burbling emotion which you endeavor to numb by gorging on videos called from a wide swash of genres, cute animals at play, amazing feats of strength, pork couture, keto cuisine, the bizarre and depraved. Because you forewent sleep, hygiene, and meals for 48 hours while seeking an ideal hideaway, Perfect getaway, a cabin in the woods, a mountain retreat where you could live out your days in solitude and tranquility. Scroll through a vast list of character defects, trying to identify the one or ones which continuously undermine your relationships. Join dozens of online groups and forums where you befriended strangers with whom you shared intimate details of your existence in an effort to gather the information and support necessary to rid yourself of those pernicious flaws. Because your screen time's increased steadily week after week after week, since the cataclysmic breakdown that followed that most recent rendition of the all too familiar refrain, this just isn't working out, brought you full circle into the vortex of yet another spiral from which you have sporadically emerged with the resolve to craft a new identity, manifesting exclusively virtuous traits and free of those myriad defects that inevitably lead to bouts of doubt and consternation, an identity to replace that which never lived up to your ideals and embodies your willingness to consider all methods of self-improvement, you are an ideal candidate for algorithmic salvation. Ashes to ashes, all fall down. Ashes to ashes, all fall down. Ashes to ashes, all fall down. Mm. What do they think about on the way down? Do they consider the lives they've led, the lies they told? Do they wonder about the comings and goings of life, the variances in temperament, the blooming and blossoming, the germinating and decaying? Are they most absorbed by their changing perspective while in flight, how it changes as they drift down and, and continues to change throughout their descent? Or are they most consumed by outcomes over which they have no control, such as where it is that they will finally land. Ashes to ashes all fall down when great trees fall. Rocks and distant hills shudder. Lions hunker down in tall grasses. 
elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence. Their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. And memory suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on, kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die. And their souls, dependent upon their nurture, shrink, now wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of cold, dark caves. And when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms slowly and always irregularly. Space is filled with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our sense is restored, never to be the same. Whisper to us. They existed. They existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed. When Great Tree Souls, Maya Angelou, there's some St. Vincent lines, John Perry Barlow, and some other things. Thank you, Great Weather for Media. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Zev. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what was that, that al algorithmic salvation? Cool. All right. Uh, our next um, reader is Jadiana Potsavinsky. Join me in welcoming her. Or are you Jadiana? Here you go. Okay. Um, she is a poet and neurodiverse youth educator based in Portland, Oregon, where she is an aficionado of ice cream. As a former post a foster youth, she enjoys working with and advocating for vulnerable youth. She writes about gender, queerness, and belonging, often through the use of natural imagery. Welcome, Dediana. Thank you, Mary. Um, so last year, I had the pleasure of meeting Jane and a lot of the wonderful folks at Great Weather for Media when I did something that was out of my comfort zone at the encouragement of friends, which was read poetry at an open mic. And I'm so glad I did because now, um, I'm part of this beautiful anthology, Escape Wheel, and it's so wonderful that this space to share poetry and hear all of each other has been created. I know I'm really appreciating it after um, all of this time kind of alone and distanced. So the poem in the book that I'm going to read, I wrote as a letter to myself when I first moved to Portland two years ago. So I'm going to start with that. Sommelier, when each day feels like a chore, remember, you're working, working to become who one day you'll feel like you always were, you upright paradigm of girlhood, taking the hurt out on yourself, just like they told you you would. Be so gentle, you put the stomachs of kittens to shame, make petals when to practice softness, Light, try to arrive less triumphantly, but more with a tender hello. It's April now, so it's still raining. You're still cold. It's May now. You're packing your things now and moving on, putting sweaters away, wishing for patio days and strangers that say yes. Yes, pet my dog, share in my life for one simple moment. It's after 10 and the night is warm, but it's time to go in. Put the clothes sign out so people don't wander in, wander away from their lives. Do you have anything that tastes like gravel after it's been raining and you forgot to take in the clothes? Home is empty and loud and no boards above you and you can hear the cats all night. You do puppet shows in the night, make angels with your hands, make yourself shiver. There is red on your dress. You do not hurt. Dish soap, toothpaste, baking soda, you know your way around stains. Do you have anything that tastes like wet pavement when you've fallen off your bike from trying to keep up with the boys? Every night you fall asleep to your neighbor's soft snore. 
bird animal moving branches in the night, only more rhythmic. You move against yourself, a wall apart. One day he will die and you won't know. The ground below is white. This does not mean snow. Underneath the magnolia tree, you tell a friend of a boy who took things from you that were not given, and the clear sky above shuts its ears. Your glass is empty, but it's all in the house. So you quietly prepare to go back to your life. Does this taste like the last time you made promises you thought you could keep? Home is empty and large. Your neighbor's already asleep. Get caught in the rain. Your throat is wet. Your dress is stained. You're shivering and so very alive. Uh, so the next couple of poems I picked, because it's October, my favorite month, um, I think there's a relationship between being queer and magic and that the, the veil is thinner during this spooky month. So this one's called Autumn. I am a thief of many things. Slowly I steal away hours of sun. The long shadows I bring build up, make time for dead things to share their light and let me do my work in secret. I take the lazy naps of noon where lovers lay beside dreaming of each other and give you long animal sleeps arboreal dreams of living so colorfully, if only for a season as the maple tree does. Pusamaras I too seek to steal and scatter farther from parent tree, to find a home or not in the soft earth that grows colder and hardens each day. From the ginkgo, I lift green and yellowing fans and give them to the wind. I cheat the katsura of its gilded hearts and throw them to the ground, to brown and sweeten the wearied sidewalk as you're called once more to be outdoors. Lastly, I will rob the apple, the trees, the last of their apples, but I invite you now to take some, to read the boughs of their burden, press them to purpose, to essence, to put in forgetful cups of warmth, lattice them into comfort for cold November nights, or open them to the core sliced neat, in a pot left to simmer, let be till they turn sweet, until you wholly don't recognize what they've become. Um, I have one last thing. I'm kind of switching between different locations of the poems. This one's called Hiding in Place. One endless hour, my niece finds me on the couch, says, JD, I want to hide together. So I pull a blanket over us. She smells of sunscreen, her arms eerily luminous from the zinc, and I think we could be ghosts, sharing a thin polka dot blanket for eternity. These past months, we've not seen anyone outside our home, save her father who comes and goes. I measure shadows, make coffee, watch numbers rise in the news, and wait for the lilacs to bloom. Look, stars, she says, pointing to the circles of light, our sky now so near. This could be my world forever, and that would be enough. Um, again, thank you all so much. Um, I feel honored to be among so many incredible writers. I feel like I'm just a fledgling, so I'm really glad to be here. Uh, no. Yeah, we loved it, Jenya. And um, thank you for mentioning that magic of the season, too. You know, we always, you know, tend to think of Halloween and spooky, but yeah, you're right, that veil. I love that way you described that veil of lifting just a bit. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Christina. Quintana, um, CQ. CQ is a queer writer with Cuban and Louisiana roots and the author of the full-length play, Scissoring, and the poetry chapbook, The Heart Wants, Finishing Line Press. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Nimrod Journal, Saw Palm, The Punch Magazine, on Cuba, and others. In addition, she is a recipient of fellowships from McDowell, Playwrights Realm, Van, Le Van Lier, New Voices of the Lark, Queer Art and Lambda Literary. Most recently, CQ served as a staff writer for the ABC series, The Baker and the Beauty. So welcome, CQ. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. This is like, uh, it's, I, you know, even in Zoom world, these like types of readings just really like warm my soul um, during all everything going on. So thank you for organizing uh, to Mary and Jane and Thomas. Um, it's great to meet you and to all the writers who've shared so far. I it really, it's meant a lot to me. Um, I'm going to share a few poems, including the poem that is in uh, this beautiful 
piece of work that I just like <laughs> love it. It's beautiful. Um, and uh, so here we go. Okay, uh, so this poem is a poem I wrote um, doing a workshop with Catherine Barnett, who I just think is like, um, speaking of magic, she's just kind of a magic being. Um, and she just inspired me so much. Um, it's called Maiden Voyage. I have to write things down because I forget or don't hear selective remembering without choice. Am I a passive character? They say characters should do not have things done to them. However, my people, our histories, our circumstances so often forced upon us recover, react, rise. Why is this passive? It seems the do and the done are all tied up in one. A white man named Aristotle decided on dramatic structure. So it was written, so it would be, except I cannot pretend to be a white man. His structure is not mine and I don't want it. What if my want is bigger than any father or son because I have held it longer? Of the mothers, aunts and daughters who are part of me though I cannot see them, I have their hands or eyes or ears, though no photographic evidence proves this or otherwise. What are their names? Even maiden means a man's name. So how can I ever catch up? Are you trans? A 75 year old woman asks, tender. No, I'm not, but I always wanted. The same woman tells the story of the only man she ever loved while her husband walks their dog in the snow. She met her lover at a swanky bar to break it off. Sounded like a black and white movie. She couldn't do it anymore. But if it's marriage you want, I'll give it to you. No, it was too late. So she married someone else, then someone else still. I could feel how her life shook open and transformed, almost like I'd been in the bar with her. That's the first. Um, and... Oh, I love it. I love the shakes. Those are great. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wrote this poem fairly recently. Um, I had this like, I had a pretty a, a tough, um, like career wise, I, I lost this uh, project that I was working on. And it was really tough on me. And I was kind of allowing myself to mourn it. Um, and uh, I was it's well, it's pretty self explanatory, but it's called US Post Office 511 West 165th. Flush with failure from the night before, I had no desire to walk to the post office without one meandering nose and four squat legs, a 15 minute journey across the avenues, annoyance painstaking raking my veins, at last arrived at its unremarkable facade, puppy whined when wife disappeared, surely forever, by his account. I crouched down as family of three emerged as one, like paper cutouts. As they went, I encouraged dog pets, yet little stranger unclamped from father's hand. Cartoon flower mask askew, she hugged me. At once a feeling COVID forgot, but I needed. Down the block, she called, I love you. And somehow I felt certain she knew me. It was just like this really special moment that happened. Um, this next poem is, um, I wrote it um, the year that my father passed and uh, uh, in my building, a guy who works in my building who's really wonderful, he shared this video and uh, that's where it comes from. Final song. A friend shared a YouTube video of a kawaii o'o, a Hawaiian bird gone extinct the year I was born. A slipshod slideshow presents images of the bird accompanied by the haunting mating call of the final living male of the species. He's calling for a female bird that no longer exists, the video tells us. Did he know his kin were gone? Did he see others die? Did they share tweets and chirps about their fates? Or did he grow up an orphan, answering something primal, no roadmap, no forebear to guide him? The loop of his cry is painful, but can I call it a cry? Maybe the call was mundane, usual. Or maybe, in fact, the bird sat terrified on his branch, howling his loneliness into the abyss. The virgin kawaii o oh, oh, gone to rest. This year is drenched in mortality. 
In grief, everything painted a certain color, even when I long for variation. When my father died, my mother told me she had never in her 66 years of life lived alone. I will never get the sound of her cries as she collapsed into his lifeless body in the ICU out of my mind. I imagine her in her too large house, weeping into the quiet, all too like our fateful bird. I live in New York, New York, and she in Houston, Texas. When she cries, I cannot hear her. What would it be like to lose someone after knowing them longer than anyone? Did Hawaii mourn the loss of its songbird? How many years did it fly the skies? Who did it come from? And uh, the last one I'm going to read is the one in the uh, that's in that's in the collection, which I'm really in the anthology. Um, and I I wish that I could actually say the I wish I could say the title the way that sentence is supposed to be. I've like practiced it, but I'm not that magical. Uh, mm -hmm. Despite my queerness. Uh, <laughs> so it's uh, buffalo, 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 buffalo. The parse sentence reads as a claim that bison who are intimidated or bullied by bison are themselves intimidating or bullying bison, at least in the city of Buffalo, implicitly Buffalo, New York. A, a city named Buffalo. This is used as a noun adjunct in the sentence. I've been to that city near Niagara Falls once. A complicated flame invited me to her cousin's wedding and I said yes, though I should have said no. A part of me thought she could be the love of my life. The bigger part of me knew she never would. Buffalo was a lesson in learning to say no, a lesson I'm still learning. B, the noun buffalo, American bison, an animal in the plural equivalent to buffaloes or buffaloes in order to avoid articles. The American bison captured my heart when I first learned its lore on a third grade field trip to the Western Heritage Museum. I stared deep into the eyes of the taxidermied specimen on display for as long as I could. My eyes lingered even when we moved away from that portion of the exhibit. The physical differences that, are, that distinguish male bull from female cow bison are subtle. In fact, males and females can look very similar, especially when the males are not yet mature. In my mid-20s, one of my best friends took me to Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in Oklahoma to behold a field of my favorite animal in its natural habitat. We stopped the car, stepped outside, and watched from afar as one mass of beauty speckled with snow devoured a collection of weeds. I tattooed myself with an American bison in 2014. I long for that animal power, that pure calm, that unadorned magnitude. See. The verb buffalo, meaning to outwit, confuse, deceive, intimidate, or baffle. Have you ever been told you were intimidating as a means of intimidation? Have you ever felt your entire body flush with buffalo? Did you know harassment is a type of buffalo? Why do so many buffalo gaslight so many buffalo? The par sentence reads as a claim that women who are intimidated or bullied by toxic men are themselves intimidating or bullying those men, at least in the city of their minds, implicitly in security, New York. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Great work on the title. I like the way you said that. It's <laughs> fine. But you know, that, that line, that the second to the last poem, when you said, I felt certain she knew me, that's wonderful, huh? Thank you so much, Mary. <laughs> Such a tender line. Thank you, Christina. Um, next, we have um, Lisa Ki Hamasaki. Welcome, Lisa. Lisa Ki has, Hamasaki has read her work in the finest cafes, courthouse, restaurant, re, excuse me, courthouse restrooms, um, cheese shops, bingo games, and zendos in North America. She writes about alligators, kimchi, dogs, spoons, buses, uh, escalators, excuse me, my glasses, um, gum and people. Um, and thank you very much for reading our second prose of the day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm kind of excited and kind of feel really weird doing this on Zoom, but it's really cool. I've never, I have been avoiding all the literary Zoom things, but I, this is really super cool. 
So thank you so much for letting me read here. Um, I'm going to read a piece of fiction. Um, and uh, it's the first time I've ever been published. So it's all, it's all good. And I really, I feel really like excited because um, during everything that's happened in the last seven months since we all sent in our work, so much has happened. So to be here and listen to all these beautiful meeting, meaningful words is really, it's really cool. All right, thank you. You, you meaning me. You stand on a balcony, chain smoking with your neighbor, Sylvia's wayward bohemian brother. 30 years ago, he was the best looking guy in town. Shoulder length black hair with eyes of a mystic owl. Back then, Sylvie would wake to find her brother asleep on her living room floor. The twinkle of one brown nipple ring sticking out from her handmade quilts. Today, his eyebrows are raccoon tails, his mustache the whiskers of a wild boar, his teeth a swampy brown color. He grunts and growls his words out on the balcony, quoting Faust, Neruda, and Shakespeare, while his sister's poodle pug terrier trots along the balcony with an empty food bowl in his mouth. You hand him another cigarette and a lukewarm beer. It's 9 a.m. You're on your way home from your job at the phone company when you see an alligator sliding along the sidewalk past the pizza palace. But you don't, right? You look back over your shoulder towards the pizza palace and there it is. You wonder if it's a triple meat or mushroom and goat cheese kind of an alligator. On, on the news, you're relieved to hear that there's been a sighting of an alligator downtown. You text your brother what you saw, even though you haven't spoken to him in years. Your brother calls you to report that the alligator ate a pineapple and ham pizza along with an arm of one of the Pizza Palace employees. He tells the tale of a time in Florida when a baby alligator climbed out of the toilet and scared your brother Jasper. There are other shared stories about reptiles and other animals until you both say goodbye at the first light of day. You arrive for your shift at the phone company. A coworker you don't like very much is distraught about her unlucky cousin who had his arm eaten by an alligator. You place your hand on her forearm to comfort her. She wears a velvet hoodie, soft like a baby fawn. You offer her a slice of pizza from your lunchbox. When she asks you what kind of pizza, you say pineapple and ham. She shrugs her shoulders and takes a slice. You're late to see friends in a movie. After locking your bike, you pass a Japanese restaurant and think you see your mother bending over the counter with a calculator. You walk half a block and nearly turn the corner where the movie house is, but then do a U-turn, returning to the restaurant. The woman who is your mother is bent over a calculator. You enter to greet her. The smell of ginger and jasmine hangs in the air. The woman looks up. It isn't your mother. You're a happy dog who loves to play catch and cuddle against your master's thigh in bed. The only thing that bothers you is your name, Felix. You want to be called something exotic and adventurous like chai latte or pico de gallo. While your owner is at work, you bring torn package wrappings from the recycling bin to hint at the name you want. Giddy with excitement, you find jalapeno poppers, pizza formaggio, and paneer tikka masala, creating a masterpiece on the living room floor. When your owner comes home, she doesn't get it, exclaiming, oh, Felix, what have you done? You spend the evening in a broom closet, still named Felix. You went on a camping trip last year after your mother's death with only the redwoods and sparrows to witness your grief. Hiking through the woods, you found a baby fawn lying on a trail. You stroked its torso with your fingers. The fawn's eyes fluttered, then lifted its head. You rushed back to your campground and brought back bread crust and a jar of honey. The sick animal licked the honey from the bread as you recited fairy tales with happy endings and songs your mother sang to you when you were sick. You fell asleep with one hand on the fawn's trunk, still singing. At first light, when you awaken, the fawn was still and cold. 
You wove flower necklaces with the fawn and eventually walked back to the woods holding the honey jar, licked clean. You're on an up escalator by, to buy coffee before work when you pass your mother going the opposite way on the down escalator. You rush up the metal steps, pack, pushing past people's shoulders, then down toward your mother who walks through the door of an underground train. An alarm sounds as you struggle to keep the train doors open, then stumble into the compartment as it begins its forward motion. At the other end of the train car, the woman who looks like your mother pulls out a bright green scarf and starts knitting while talking into her hands-free phone. She speaks in Spanish, English, Spanish, laughing, knitting, laughing. Your mother never spoke Spanish. You fall in love with this knitting, self-assured, Spanish-speaking, English-speaking Asian woman who looks like your mother. You wonder what it had been like to have a mother who knitted, spoke Spanish, laughed loudly in public places. When you turn to look again, the woman who isn't your mother is gone. You move to sit with the woman who looked like your mother was sitting. Your phone vibrates. It's your supervisor at the phone company, wondering why you're not at work. You tell him you have the stomach flu and head home. You're on a balcony again with your neighbor's brother. He's mumbling poetry in Portuguese, definitely not Spanish. You rock your body to the rhythm of his voice, the beer buzz settling in. Through his unbuttoned flannel shirt, the grim reaper flips you the bird below one sad round nipple ring. You kiss it. It tastes like rust and pot and sweat. His lips find yours, and it's like chewing the mouth of a drunken bear with a bit of wild boar whiskers thrown in. You step back, chugging the rest of the bottle and say, I keep seeing my dead mother on the train or in sushi restaurants. For a moment, I'm convinced it's her waiting to greet me or scold me or make me lunch. He finishes his beer, then opens two more. A common occurrence, he says. There was a boy I knew in grade school, hair cut short like a baby fawn. His heart stopped beating on the playground. I see him from time to time on soccer fields or in pubs as a young boy or an old man holding a ball or a slice of pizza. Tears cover your face and your lips find his again. When your mouths separate, he encircles you with his heavy paw-like arms. You reach for the newly opened bottle, take a pull, then rest your head against his tattoo of the Grim Reaper, of the Grim Reaper who's still flipping you the bird and say, so with a boy whose heart stopped beating on the playground, and the unlucky cousin that got his arm eaten by the alligator? He nods. The boy, the cousin, the alligator, your mother, and you. His sister's dog trots onto the balcony, empty food bowl in his mouth, and looks up at us expect expectantly. And we both say in unison. And Felix, too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. I so enjoy the way all those pieces come together in your story. It's Thank like, you. It's, it's wonderful. And, and if, you, if you loved it as much as, as uh, we all did, you've got to read the story over and over again to see those pieces, how they come together. It's really, yeah. it's really lovely. It's so sad. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Janet Berry is next. Janet Berry is a musician, poet, and photographer. Her work can be found in journals and anthologies, including Parenthesis, Mom Egg Review, Radius Lit, Off the Coast, Third Wednesday, and Around Concord. She has received several Pushcart nominations, as well as the Best of the Net Award. Janet holds degrees in organ performance and poetry. Welcome to Janet. Hey, thank you. Thank you. And um, can I see a thumbs up if you can hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes, wonderful. All right, thank you. And thank you to the editors and the organizers for this great, this great volume and this great reading. Um, it's just wonderful. I'm going to start with my first poem is titled Flogging. It's a pretty dark poem. Uh, and this is the one that was published in, in um, Escape Wheel. Flogging. I have spent all day mourning for a 100-year-old dead horse. Flogged. And it is said, 
that Nietzsche wept uncontrollably upon the neck of this horse, then lost his sanity, entered into the pain and terror of the beast. A hackney horse conscripted since youth to bear her human cargo, to tear her feet on the cobblestones, her flesh on the burning lines of harness and whip, to take what comfort she could at the end of the day, if hay is offered or shelter or nothing, and Nietzsche going insane, this one day when the offering is nothing but cruelty, hugging the animal as her eyes roll white in her head, her mane drips blood, haunches quiver with indecision, escape or succumb to that horror, that common horror we all know is present every day, we all flee every day, as we willingly strap on our blinders, our burdens onto our shoulders, Look up the sun and say, today is a new day and I have work to do. I cannot weep for dead horses or fools. That was flogging. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll read a story, uh, as well, I'll read a poem that is in a number of sections and it was written a year ago about this time. So it's sort of an autumn poem. Um, and it's titled, This is My Story. It's just a weaving of, of the reality that was mine a year ago. This is my story, section one. Together we chant, give peace to every heart, give peace to every heart. My guitar feels solid against my rib cage. My fingers know which strings to pluck, give peace, give peace, give peace to every heart. Two, yesterday the hummingbirds left. Their small hearts will carry them across the gulf. Will they bless me for the sugar water I gave them all this long hot summer? As I watched them from my window and wondered where home was? Will they let my heart travel even a small distance with them? I have not been home for three tired years now. Three, around the table. A woman, a woman turning 90, a man losing his home, a man many years homeless, a leader, a whisperer, a survivor of statistics, a poet, an artist, a newly diagnosed illness, a musician, a drug addict, a helper, a prophet. Can you hear the children dancing? Corn on the cob melts butter through our paper plates around the table. <clears throat> Four. I keep my old dog on a leash tethered to the solid ground. I wonder what has happened to her young heart which still runs after chipmunks in her dreams and never gives up. Five, they've planted new flowers, mums, whose colors match so well the season and the sun. I wonder what they've done with the old ones, the begonias and marigolds that bloomed all summer long. Six, this is my story. My dog will lie still to listen to it. The leaves turning gold will abandon their autumn lover for just one moment to hear it. The children walking by the river will stop throwing stones at the ducks. The homeless will look up. The angry will forget to choose sides. The blank pages of poetry books will rustle open to let their poems fly free. And the last segment, seven, in this, this lengthy poem. Seven. In the hall, the smell of sweet tobacco. I think of the Indian custom of leaving tobacco to honor the spirits of the dead. Tobacco for the ancestors, tobacco for the roadkill, tobacco for the child spirits wandering, tobacco for the lover spirits entwined. Tobacco for beaver, moose, and skunk. Tobacco for the slaughterhouses. Tobacco for the workers in the slaughterhouses and the slaughtered in the slaughterhouses. Tobacco to the students in schools and the old men in the nursing homes. Tobaccos to the vultures and the hopeless and the helpless. Tobacco to the woman spirits giving birth, washing blood from their new creation. Tobacco to the new command of each sunrise. Give peace to every heart. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Tom. Read one final poem, um, which is an odd poem for a poet to write because its title is in a place without words, 
would there be love again? There's a lot of words. <laughs> In a place without words, would there be love again? Imagine. No words to lash ourselves and others with. No words to pray in gods that teach us to hate and kill with. No words to string along fingers forever pointing spear bones at our neighbors with. No words to build our, beat our children with. No word to strangle the trees and poison the fish with. No words to count up prophets in dark places of dust and greed with. No words to dance along ridges and walls and dagger point fence posts with. No words to hurl our hate stones with. No words to sight down gun barrels with, no words to taunt in suicides with, no words to feed the bully brave with, no words to kick the homeless with, then walk high heeled along gold slick streets with. No words, no words to say you and me with, no words to flay skin from the lives of the despised with. No words to buy the slave with, no words to sell disease with, no words to cheat and scam with, then scorn the poor and the powerless with. No words to silence the sacred with, no words to slay the animals with, no words to praise the mighty with, no words to dance over the heads of others which, with each step pounding into the mud with. No words to steal the land with, no words to frack the sands with, no words to bomb the buildings with, no words to cage the children, beat the woman, defeat the hopeless, and shame their graves with, no words, no words, would there be love again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you for your thoughtful and tender words. They so important. Thank you. Beautiful. Our last poet... It's not on the screen right now. I wonder if um, Nicholas Powers is there? Yes. Did your son go to sleep? No. I'm going to move to a quieter place because right now, okay, I think he may have stopped with this toy. Okay. He was playing with a very loud toy. What's his name? His name is True. Hi, True. Okay. You want to say hi to folks? Yeah. I know he does it. <laughs> <laughs> He'll come when you least expect him or want him there. Yeah, yeah, he will. <laughs> anyway, let me read your everyone. All right, let me read your bio, Nicholas, before I forget. <laughs> uh, Nicholas Powers is the author of *The Ground Below Zero, 9/11 to Burning Man, *New Orleans to Darfur, Haiti to Occupy Wall Street* by Ups Upset Press. His writing has appeared in HuffPost, The Independent, Insider.com, The Village Voice. Truth Out, an Apogee Journal. He's our last speaker, our last reader of today. Uh, and welcome, Nicholas. Thank you. Um, Andrew. <laughs> Andrew. Right. He's banging on Alexa Hi. right now. He's like, I really want to hear happy birthday for the 80th time today. <laughs> um, all right. So this is actually, it's, it's good that he's here because this is actually inspired by going to the park with my son. Uh, so this is to kiss a tree. Tree, I say, and lean over so my son can touch it. But he doesn't touch a word. His fingers caress things, rough bark, waxy leaves, dirt. For him, everything floats in, through, and back out of words as, they, as if they were soft, gelatinous bubbles. He says tree, and the sound reflects the moment, then pops. He speaks everything new. A falling leaf, a miracle. God was this once for me, a diffused, overwhelming wonder. Tree, I say, and I follow my son's lead. I caress the bark like a new lover. I finger ridges, stroke curves, and focus on the grain in a gently curious way. I roll my back on it. My son does too. We giggle, we look up. Wind bends branches like hair by a blow dryer. They breathe for us, I tell him, and my reassurance is music. He teaches me to hear music. The tree is our slow lung, a baritone exhale of oxygen into sky. When we reach for answers, we lift our arms up like branches. My son kisses bark, French kisses it, and I should say stop, but I kiss it too. 
It's a new language we're trying out. Our mouths feel awkward, but we're learning. Thank you. So I appreciate that. Thank you for, you know, dealing with the live background. That was cool. Are you, are oh, you good that's, to that's all the poem I have. Yeah. Oh, well, thank yeah. you. Thank you for that, Nicholas. And thanks for the music of your son in the background. Um, thank you to everyone. So let's just give everyone a round of applause before I give some closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, a few announcements before we conclude today. Um, um, it was really wonderful, and I hope that um, you'll, you'll all be back on November 21st when we have one more anthology. I think it's our last one, right, Jane? Oh, we have two more. Um, November 21st, so we have an anthology launched. So please join us again um, to listen to some more people who are in that book with you. Some other announcements. Submissions for next year's anthology opened a couple of days ago. They go from October 15th and run until January 15th. So that's for poetry and for, for short fiction. Um, check out our 10 minute Zoom reading every Wednesday from 7.30 to 7. Okay, just a second. Um, Jane just sent me a note. Okay, sorry. All right, check out our 10 minute Zoom reading every Wednesday from 7.30 to 7.40 Eastern time. Um, it's really great. It's um, Thomas um, hosts that, I think almost always, right Thomas? Yeah. Um, he, under the, the name, uh, under a different name, which you'll have to tune in to find out, but it is Thomas. Um, they're really wonderful. It's like you, you log on, it's from 7.30 to 7.40. There you, you, you wonderful um, poetry and, and prose, and then off you can go to dinner or something. This Wednesday, you can hear the amazing words of buttered roll before your dinner. And join our Sunday series on alternate Sundays. On uh, Sunday, October 25th, join us for an open mic and then enjoy the words of Ariel Lassavoli and William Washington. And that's a lot of fun because you're going to hear a lot. You know, you can read too. We'd love to hear some more of your work um, and, and join with others doing that. Again, our next anthology launch is November 21st. We hope to see you there. And I'm going to close with these words from our introduction, from, um, from the introduction to uh, Escape Wheel. We said, and we, we still mean it with all our heart, um, we wish you all safety and beauty. Keep writing.